what, what can be done? What are the key points? Of course, we don't have hours and hours to talk about that, but I'm asking both of you to give us some kind of hints about I would say the there are two entry points. One is the local level. So Charles mentioned before, we have really regions where uh, perhaps there are lots of jobs which are lost and, and lots of massive changes which are come about, for example, here around Brandenburg. So I think you, you have to um, start from there and not make top-down decisions about any forms of transformations. Uh, to empower the people and, and, and with, together with them find solutions for the future, but also addressing the question of their goals and, you know, and, and from what there is already and from their strengths to find some sort of concrete solutions. And by this you rebuild local democracy and, uh, because people, once they have their own um, you know, ways of going about their own future, they can, of course, also go to their representatives. So what I'm saying is not weakening representative democracy, it's strengthening local democracy and empowering the people. This is one point, and I made, as you said in my book, and with, with Klaus Legeby, the pro also the, I, uh, the proposition to have future councils would, would be one way of addressing long-term questions, not only short-term questions, with, um, uh, you know, with citizens um, raised by lot. This is just one proposition. I don't think it's enough, because I think that if you have some sort of participatory way of going about at the local level, and you have a political system which is not able uh, or not compatible with this, because this is, is a way of collaborating, and then you have a competitive way of the political system, if this doesn't match, you know, I don't think participation, participation will help a lot. So I do, I do believe this is only one part of the question. The other part of the question is how to have a political system where the competitiveness, even between you know, ministries or with even departments within ministries, uh, can be sort of circumvented by some forms of processes where collaborative modes are able to produce better outcomes. So it would be the biggest common denominator, and not the lowest common denominator, which is the product of competition. So you need to reform also the political system, that's what I'm saying. Because otherwise, all the local and participative ways uh, of, of coming about with solutions will not, be, will not meet a political system which is able to pick up solutions. Yes. <coughs> I mean, I think that um, along with the kind of big issues that I mentioned earlier, like I mean, Europe and uh, Eurozone and so on, I think what Patricia is talking about is very, very important at the, uh, another kind of operation at the local level where <clears throat> what is contributed by, from, from outside, you might say, is, well, the word in French is animation, means somebody who goes in there and talks to people and says, oh, well, what, what exactly, what would you like to see? And there are differences, so let's talk it out and so on. And I've seen this happen, and of course, Patricia's been in one of these, uh, the, the consultative has, is one of these ma manners of doing that. And what you find there is something very different, not, winners and losers in the ordinary sense, but the people concerned change because they're talking of what's really gonna be the best future for them. They're getting to know each other, the various uh, walls of suspicion between different groups and so on begin to fall away. They begin to get a clearer idea of what the alternatives are, right? And then the, the opacity of the political system, at least in this area and for their purposes, begins to be finally penetrated, finally opened up. So I think that uh, path to uh, a better democracy is at both these levels. I mean, raising certain issues which are always just shelved and set aside as though technology could solve the problem on the national or even European level, but at the same time, doing this kind of work on the, on the local level. Thank you. Let, let me jump back a little bit on the future councils because it's, in very, it's very interesting and I was going to ask the question how um, a revitalized democracy can possibly um, be open to consider the challenges such as sustainability and climate change and, the, and, and consider the boundaries both in spatial sense and in temporal sense, in, in the sense of time, right? So it's a very interesting perspective. I, I've heard a talk um, a couple of months ago, a very interesting and weird talk by a scholar from Japan who is a game theory specialist, and I was skeptical like crazy because, well. So he was doing a game theory experiment um, about um, 
these things work like groups de deciding how to de distribute a certain amount of resources among themselves and whether to con and, and the, the where they distributed would influence this, the next round of the next group. So he did this kind of experiments and analyzed the results and then he came up with the idea that somehow whether, whether it make a difference to embody in the procedure of the group deciding about the distribution a representative of the future group and the perspective of the future group. So he started doing this experiment and the results changed. So he started to do a real experiment with people, especially in Southeast Asia, uh, about having a really focused group in which some of the participants uh, were prepared in order to imagine the future, to really, they had the task to imagine uh, the future perspective and represented it in this group. Uh, could that work with a future council or how do I have to imagine a future council? Well, the future council was, uh, the idea was, uh, it's not exactly the same as structural change in areas where you have a clear problem which is identified already, which has to be specified, but which is clearly there. The idea of a future council was uh, to have it in, in different communities um, in order to bring about which the problems were, which are not, you know, uh, not necessarily clear, you know what I'm saying? So perhaps hidden problems also. But of course you have to face the problem how to bring in the, the perspectives of future generations. And um, of course somehow you need to make, um, there are different ways of going about this. Uh, also through theoretical, theatrical uh, theater play and, you know, to, as if, to play as if would be, because you can also have, you know, empty chairs in order to remember that there are future generations also taking part in this conversation and many other ways we should experiment with, kind of, we, we don't know how to do that. And I think this is a good way because I think it alters our own way of dealing with our present if you think about uh, the future generations and how you leave the planet. So it's very important to experiment with different ways of going about either with representatives or through imaginations uh, or as if plays. You know, like the king, you have a crown on your head and you think you're the king. So something like that, uh, I think, uh, should be able to, um, to include the perspectives of, of future generations. So there is a performative power in, in playing that role somehow mm -hmm. that opens up possibilities. Do we need and a different social imaginary. Is that what is gonna save democracy in the future? Do we need to transform, can we? Do we need to transform a social imaginary? How can a social imaginary be transformed? Does this question make sense at all? Oh yes, it does, it does make, make sense. I mean, because <clears throat> social imaginaries are more or less filled with illusion, more or less shot through with uh, self, uh, self-congratulatory uh, <clears throat> epithets, more or less confused and so on. And <clears throat> precisely the kind of situation we were imagining a minute ago, you know, somebody coming into a local community and getting people together and they talk and they see the possibilities and so on, they're, they're both at changing the way their community operates because they're talking about these things together and therefore also the social imaginary of this community, which is the understanding they share of how the community operates. I mean, social imaginaries are always correlative to certain practices, right? If you, social imaginaries you can define as the kind of common understanding you need to sustain certain practices. And if the practices change, the social imaginary changes by definition. Okay, so, so from the practices, the social imaginary can be, can be transformed yeah. and changed. Yeah. Interesting. So let's stay, stay with the practices because, and it's probably the trickier question is, um, what are or who are the drivers and the agents of change? Um, so I'm not expecting a list of names here, not of course, but um, what social actors or social movements uh, or project experiment spaces um, can, can embody the possibility for change right now? And, or, or what are changes at the level of institutions? How can that change? Which institutions? How can we move on? So it's a very multi-layered question. Yes, please. Yes. Thank you very much for a wonderful sort of opening and, and framing of a lot of these issues. The point that I'd like to come back to is the question of the social imaginaries and social movements. And this interests me a great deal. 
the, the question is how, I'd be interested in your reactions to how can we foster the kind of substantive discussion, if you will, backcasting in a certain way, um, that also deals with questions of identity and narratives of identity and a vision forward in that sense without losing the intrinsic complexity. So you, you can have a social movement where it's a very obvious and a very direct relationship to what my interests personally are and they're discernible. It becomes very difficult when we start talking about sustainable futures which are ill-defined, complex, and we don't have a prescription. We, we never will. So I, I'm, I'm curious at your thoughts of how that happen, can happen, and I would say probably in different locations, different contexts. Oh, I forgot to say, I'm Elon Chabai at the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies. I think there's, there's no <clears throat> social movement and, and uh, movements for sustainability are no exception. There's no uh, significant social movement that doesn't involve knitting together people from rather different perspectives. So what this requires, like a, kind of, a kind of leadership, if you like, where you not only uh, are aware of that, but you can, you have, well, we say in social, say, in uh, philosophy and social science, uh, the hermeneutic capacity to understand where other people are coming from. Right? And very often, political leadership totally fails in that regard and just puts people's backs up, like in the, you know, in the whole campaign of Trump versus Hillary. I mean, all this language of deplorables was just counterproductive. Whereas, there's a side of these Trump voters which is onto something real and important. Uh, their sense of dignity is uh, being uh, undermined by the fact that they can't get a job and so on. So the leadership which can touch that and you know, say, show that, understand that and bring it out, that is the kind of leadership that we need making large coalitions. Let's let me add on that. I think before Barbara said, uh, or Charles, or both of you, that uh, the social movements are, who are, which are most um, sort of interesting are the ones who also have practices. And I think in particular with sustainability questions, it's very important to have experiments about practices, which makes it much more credible to find ways of dealing with, with uh, sustainable questions. And I think, of course, there is a plurality of, of different experiments and different ways of looking at sustainability. But at least to have some sort of, you know, real grounding uh, of social movements is very important in this respect. I'm just thinking briefly of um, what I've learned from Kyle White, who is a philosopher and, and uh, a member of a First Nation community in, in the U.S. And he um, just said how obvious it is for First Nation communities uh, in their self-understanding as a community to to imagine uh, the, up to the seventh generation, which is constitutive for whatever happens now. Uh, so there are ways in which, um, which probably we have lost some of that in our own traditions, but in which that is not just anticipating, it's not the future, it's the present. So the seventh generation is, is part of who we are now. 